Dead America, Low Country. Written by Derek Slayton. Narrated by Aaron Smith. Chapter 1. Day Zero Plus One. Grace stared out the passenger window, looking out over the water. The sun was just beginning to rise over their backs, casting a warm glow on the lapping waves. As they crossed the Hilton Head Bridge towards Bluffton, she turned to gaze at her brother, Dante, driving the car. Growing up, nobody had ever believed they were related. Their features weren't terribly similar, and then there was the matter of his ebony hair contrasting her honey blonde. At this point, however, they couldn't look more different. Her chest constricted as her gaze lingered on his facial scars. Scars he had because of her. She traced every dip of his skin, all up his right arm to his neck and face. Her brother didn't have an eye anymore, because of her. Grace looked down at her left hand, her own scarring much more minor, and not noticeable unless one was looking for it. You're being quiet this morning, Dante said, side-glancing her. What do you expect? she asked, rolling her eyes. You drug me out of bed at seven in the morning to go on a store run. He chuckled. I'm sorry I interrupted your beauty rest, princess, he drawled. But unless I'm mistaken, I'm pretty sure this super center has a coffee shop. The island was a hot spot for the wealthy elite to vacation, which meant that they had to cross to the mainland for something like a super center, lest it blight the landscape of multi-million dollar homes and resorts. Hopefully they have the IV bag option, Grace groaned. Because if I'm going to be awake for this funeral, I'm going to need caffeine injected straight into my veins. Dante smirked. Pretty sure that's a Seattle exclusive. Well, sign me up then, she moaned in excitement. Only been here three days, and I'm so ready to get back home. Explain to me again why we're out here for the funeral, when nobody else is. He shook his head. You know that Grandma wasn't close to much of anybody. Except for us, he replied gently. Especially after... You know. Grace looked down at her hand again. Fire. Especially after the fire that disfigured him. She swallowed and nodded. Okay, I'll buy that, she said. But what I don't understand is why we're driving off island to go to the super center at seven in the morning. He shook his head. The pastor asked if I could pick up a few things at the store for the reception he explained. I woke up early and thought it might be good to beat the crowds to the store. Well, thank you very much for including me in your little adventure, she said with a sigh. Glad to know you value my advice on which chips pair well with a wake. Dante chuckled and reached down, flicking on the radio. We have a couple more miles to go. Why don't you find us a song? He suggested, and turned up the volume a bit. There have been unconfirmed reports of rioting in Texas, a radio announcer said. Federal officials have thus far refused comment, saying that they are aware of the situation and are mon- Grace hit the CD button on the dash, and the car filled with crunchy, distorted classic rock. She bobbed her head and cranked the volume louder. That's better, she declared. Way too early to be dealing with the woes of the world. She unrolled the window and waved her hand in the wind as they drove down the mostly empty road for a few more miles. There were stretches of apartments and some strip malls, with a whole lot of wetlands in between. As Dante pulled into the parking lot of the supercenter, there were already a dozen cars sitting out front, as it was the only thing open in the area. It sat in the middle of a long strip mall, stretching for a couple hundred yards in both directions. Well, brother... Grace said as she turned the volume back down. Your master plan worked perfectly. We certainly beat the rush. He rolled his eyes. You joke, he said. But I'll be willing to bet there isn't going to be a line for the coffee shop. You're paying, right? she asked. Depends, he replied with a smirk. Are you getting coffee? Or one of those upscale fancy drinks with 47 words in the title that would require me to take out a second mortgage to pay for? Grace shrugged. Well, we are in a resort town, she said. It would feel wrong to not go fancy with my coffee. 
And you'll gladly take out that second mortgage because it will mean you won't have to listen to me complain for the rest of the morning that you woke me up before the sun rose. Eh, that's money well spent, he agreed, chuckling. They got out of the compact sedan, slamming the doors behind them. Dante fumbled around with the key fob, hitting what he thought was the lock. But instead, the alarm started blaring, lights flashing on and off. Grace laughed and shook her head, leaning over and snatching the key from his hand, turning the screeching alarm off. Damn rentals, her brother muttered. Hey, you're the one that wanted to go budget, she shot back, pointing the key at him. For an extra ten bucks a day, we could have had a convertible. He scoffed. When I reserved the car, I didn't think a convertible in October was the best idea, he explained. That was before I realized the humidity here is still 120%, even in the fall. Imagine that. Other parts of the country have different weather than Seattle, Grace said, gasping dramatically. It's crazy, I know. Dante opened his mouth to respond, but a loud siren cut him off. An ambulance screamed into the lot and screeched to a stop in front of the supercenter. That better not be for the barista, Grace joked, shaking her head. Dante shrugged. If my experience working retail is any indication, he said, it's probably for an employee slitting their wrists in the break room because they can't take the customers any more. Did you ever think about seeing a therapist when you were working retail? she asked, playfully bumping his shoulder. He barked a laugh. Guessing you've never seen a retail worker's paycheck. Touché, she conceded, and waved for him to follow her. Come on, let's get that coffee before I'm forced to take a nap in the parking lot. They headed for the front doors, reaching the sidewalk as two EMTs nearly ran into the store manager exiting the front. He looked frazzled, eyes large and unblinking. A dark crimson stain splashed across his work vest. Oh, thank God you're here he babbled. What's the problem? One paramedic asked. The manager threw his hands up. Some homeless guy went crazy, he exclaimed. He just came in and started attacking a couple of customers. Is anybody hurt? The EMT asked. The older man nodded, jerking his thumb over his shoulder. Yeah, he bit one of the customers on the shoulder, he said, rubbing his forehead. I'm sorry, the paramedic intoned, blinking in shock. Did you say bit? Are you sure? The manager raised his palms. I know, it sounds crazy, he admitted. But I looked myself. It's definitely a bite mark. Pretty bad one, too. Okay, the EMT replied, shaking his head. Where is the customer now? In my office, the portly man replied. And the homeless man? The paramedic added. Is he still on sight? The manager nodded. Yeah, he just... He shook his head vigorously. He just wouldn't calm down. A few customers and I managed to shove him into the handicapped bathroom and lock the door. He's still freaking out, banging on the door. He's not saying anything, just screaming or moaning. Not sure which. Okay, it sounds like he got a hold of some bad drugs, the EMT explained. These pushers are cutting stuff with some questionable shit. We'll take care of it. The manager nodded tiredly and stepped aside. He glanced over at the brother and sister standing nearby and forced a smile. Don't worry he blurted. We're still open. The situation is under control. Sounds like it, Dante said wryly. Grace's eyes softened as she saw the despair on the manager's face and smiled brightly. Mr. Manager, she said in an overly bubbly tone, is the coffee shop open? He perked up at the pretty girl, asking for his help, straightening his shoulders. Yes, ma'am, he replied, smiling and nodding. Best coffee you're going to find on island or off. He reached into his vest, carefully avoiding the blood, and pulled out a coupon, holding it out to her. Here you go. This will get you a free pastry with your coffee. Well, thank you, she replied with a wink, and accepted the coupon. Dante pouted. Don't I get a free pastry? The manager blanched, patting down his pockets. Oh, he's just joking with you, Grace piped up offering another bright smile, and grabbed her brother's large, firm bicep. And besides, they're just empty calories, she said to her brother. Can't risk your physique over that. Come on. She pulled on his arm, and he let her drag him into the store. 
On the way in, he offered the manager a smile and a nod in thanks for the kindness. The manager returned it and then scrubbed his hands down his face in his panic. As the duo entered the store, they looked over towards the bathrooms where the banging was coming from. A few employees stood by it, arms crossed, looking concerned but staunchly holding their perimeter to make sure no customers went close. Dante lingered, listening to the snarling and screaming coming from inside. This is my absolute favorite time of the year, Grace gushed as she picked up a sparkly pumpkin decoration. Can't wait to get back home and decorate the house upright. Her brother smiled, thinking back to all the years they'd done a big Halloween production, setting up many haunted houses for the neighbor kids to come through. It was a big favorite of hers, and he loved to see her happy. As she dug through the decorations, he felt eyes on him and turned to look at the next aisle. Hiding partially behind the end cap display was a young girl, maybe ten years old, peeking out at him, eyes wide with fear. Dante offered a friendly smile to her and turned in her direction. Kneeling down to get to her level, It's okay. You don't have to be afraid, he said softly. I'm not a monster. He reached up and ran his hand up and down his scars. See? They don't hurt, and they're not going to hurt you. It's just the way I look now. She swallowed hard, a little more relaxed, but still looking afraid. He stuck his tongue out, making a silly face, and the little girl burst out laughing. An older woman turned around from the vases behind her daughter and scowled, stepping up and grabbing the girl by the shoulders. What in the hell do you think you're doing? she demanded. Dante stood up, holding up a hand, and the woman recoiled a bit when she looked at his face. Your daughter saw me and was scared, he explained gently. I just showed her that I wasn't a monster, that's all. She glared at him, grinding her teeth and then tugged on her daughter's hand. Come on, it's time to go, she said sharply, turning on her heel. Dante sighed. He was used to people being difficult about his injuries, but it didn't get any easier. The woman had looked like she wanted to rip into him, but likely realized with so many witnesses she didn't want to become internet famous for a meltdown in the supercenter. Why do you do that? Grace asked, stepping away from the decorations. Dante shook his head. People shouldn't be afraid of me because of how I look, he explained. I'm just like anybody else. I understand that, she replied. But one of these days someone is going to beat your ass. She crossed her arms. He winked at her with his good eye. There's a reason I took up MMA training, he said. She rolled her eyes. Grab a cart and come on, she said. Let's get what we need and go find my coffee. He grabbed a cart from the corral, and they headed for the back of the store where the grocery aisles were. They headed down each one peeking around, but couldn't find the soft drinks. Excuse me, ma'am? Dante said politely to a young woman in a vest working an end cap display. Yes, sir, she trailed off, jaw dropping when she looked up at his face. Oh my God, I'm so sorry, sir, she gushed, waving her hands in front of her face. I didn't mean to react that way. It's just, you caught me off guard, and that's really not an excuse. It's just... It's okay, he assured her, holding up a hand. My ex had the same reaction when I asked her to marry me. The woman's mouth stayed open, but no sound came out. Her face horrified at how to deal with the situation. Don't pay any attention to him, Grace said, stepping forward. He's just joking. She paused and glanced at her brother, raising an eyebrow. Wait, you are joking, right? He smirked and nodded. See, she said, smacking him lightly on the shoulder. He's joking. I'm sorry, he trailed off, checking her name tag. Bailey, just having a little fun. She looked relieved and let out a deep whoosh of breath, offering a smile. I'm so glad, she said and cleared her throat. But I mean, what happened? She clapped her hands over her mouth, eyes widening again. Horrified, she just blurted that out. Oh my God, she said through her hands and then moved them to her reddening cheeks. I'm so sorry. I don't know what's wrong with me today. Please just ignore me. It's really okay, Grace said gently. My brother Dante here pulled me out of a fire years ago. He's quite the hero. 
Bailey nodded, looking grateful that they overlooked her social missteps. Very brave of you, she said. Your sister is lucky to have you. Any woman would be lucky to have him, Grace said, waggling her eyebrows. Brave, responsible, extremely fit. He's a catch, my brother. Before either could respond, somebody barked from behind them. Hey, if you're done chit-chatting, can I get some help over here? Bailey glanced around Dante to see a man in a button-down shirt and shoes that looked more expensive than her car. Excuse me just a moment, she said, holding up a finger to the duo and heading over to the impatient customer. What in the world are you doing? Dante hissed to his sister. Grace shrugged with a smirk. Just trying to be your wingman. Wingman? he asked, eyebrows reaching his hairline. I'm old enough to be her father. She cocked her head. So? she shot back. Maybe she's into older guys. And let's be honest, it's been a while for you. How in the hell do you know that? he demanded. She crossed her arms. Am I wrong? Well, no, he admitted through his teeth, and then shook his head. But still, how the hell do you know that? She smirked, but before she could answer, the asshole customer's voice rose. You need to learn how to do your job, girl, he declared. How do you not know if you carry it? Bailey wrung her hands in front of her. Sir, I'm sorry, this isn't my usual store, she stammered. If you can just give me a minute— Oh, so you're going to waste more of my time, he snapped. Fucking worthless kids not caring about their jobs. Dante clenched his jaw and turned towards the man. Just don't hit him, Grace hissed, reaching out to tap her brother on the shoulders. No promises, he muttered, and walked over, stepping in front of the young woman. You really need to learn how to talk to people properly, he said. The man sneered. Nice rug burn there, Chachi, he mocked. You must be a hit with the ladies. Not the only thing I can hit, Dante said, staring him down. The man glared back at him, fear and tough guy syndrome warring in his eyes. Before anything could escalate further, a loud scream pierced the air from the front of the store, followed quickly by a second. What the hell was that? Dante asked as all four of them turned towards the source. The mean customer crossed his arms, probably broadcasting your ugly mug on the TVs. Before Dante could respond, a few gunshots went off rapidly, causing the quartet to flinch. Bailey immediately pulled out her radio, bringing it to her lips. Frontline! What's going on up there? she demanded. There was no response on the radio. Before she could try again, a male employee came tearing down the aisle towards them. Three people ran behind him, gaining on him as he hobbled, one of his legs bleeding crimson all over the tiles. Help me! he screamed, reaching for the stunned group. Help me! They watched in horror as two of the people chasing him tackled him from behind. The kids screamed as they bit into his flesh, one into his thigh, the other for the neck. Bailey screamed, tears flooding her cheeks, and the asshole customer threw up his palms as one of the EMTs bypassed the tussle on the floor and tore towards him. What the fuck? he cried, taking a panicked step back, frozen in fear. Dante lunged forward, grabbing the EMT around the waist and flinging it backwards. The snarling and bloody man hit the ground, but immediately scrambled to its feet, rushing him again. Dante fell into a fighting stance, looking around frantically for something, anything he could use to his advantage. He spotted the next end camp, which was bare leaving a few metal shelves about chest high. He rushed towards them and grabbed the EMT on the way by, clutching his throat and pushing it away from him. You need to calm down, Dante bellowed, staring into the EMT's glassy eyes as she tried to snap and chomp at him. The dead hunger there made his blood run cold, and he realized there was a massive wound in the man's throat. This is not a living, breathing human, he thought his mind reeling. How was this possible? They'd just seen this EMT speaking and walking around normally not ten minutes before. The dead EMT continued to thrash about, trying to bite at him. Grace screamed something unintelligible behind him, and Dante knew he couldn't let it go and get bitten himself. 
He grabbed the back of the thing's head and slammed it back towards the metal shelf. He timed it so that when the thing chomped down, he pushed it forward so that its jaws clamped around the metal instead. Dante! Grace screamed as he reared back to deliver a strike, but he ignored her, hitting hard, driving the head partially through the shelf. Teeth shattered and spewed everywhere, the corpse's mouth hooking on the bottom of the shelf, rendering it stuck. It thrashed violently, limbs everywhere, and Dante backed away from it slowly, standing next to his sister. Oh my god, are you okay? she cried, gripping his bicep tightly. He nodded, swallowing hard, not taking his eyes off of the flailing corpse. Yeah, I'm good, he said absently. What in the hell is wrong with that guy? she demanded, voice shrill. Dante shook his head. I don't know, he replied, but I'm not sure he's still a guy. Bailey screamed, motioning wildly towards the aisle where three more dead-eyed men tore towards them. One was the employee that had fallen and been attacked, and it was clear that something was sinister and unreal about the situation. Is there some place we can hide? Grace gushed, but Bailey didn't answer, staring wide-eyed at the approaching men. She grabbed the employee by the shoulders and turned her away from it, giving her a shake. Is there some place we can hide? The... Bailey stammered, pointing wildly. The break room. It's this way. She took off like a shot, and Grace followed. Dante grabbed the asshole customer by the collar and jerked him along, the man finally snapping out of it enough to follow. Bailey led them to the back of the store, making a turn down the wall. There was a small room about twenty yards down, and she pulled out a set of keys, fumbling with them to get one into the lock. Dante glanced down one aisle, and saw a young portly couple ducked down behind a cereal display, clutching each other. Get over here! he barked, waving wildly at them. They scrambled out from cover, and he waved even harder for them as a few corpses tore around the corner behind them into the aisle. Hurry up! he bellowed and Bailey threw the door open so everyone could pile inside. Dante waited for the couple to fly in past him, and then darted inside, slamming the door just in the nick of time. Bodies thumped against it from the other side, and he threw the deadbolt backing away from the door, shaking his head. The group stared in horror as bloodied hands smacked against the small window, gnashing their teeth against the safety glass. A familiar head appeared in the window, Jesus fucking Christ, the mean customer breathed. The EMT's bottom jaw was unhinged, missing several teeth, dangling and bouncing against its neck as it tried to smack its way through the door. Dante clenched his jaw and walked to the door, pulling the shade down over the window to conceal them in the small break room. Bailey raised a shaking hand to her forehead. What the hell is going on? Chapter 2 The banging on the door continued, and the group stood silent, trying to make sense in their heads of what was going on. The silence broke when the woman from the cereal aisle began to cough violently. Her boyfriend wrapped an arm around her, trying to steady her in her fit. Are you okay? Bailey asked, leaning over to check on her. Yeah, just the cold, the woman finally gasped, straightening back up, having some issues shaking it the last couple of days. Bailey nodded. We might have some cold medicine in the cabinets if you think it will help, she suggested, motioning to the counter behind her. Are you fucking kidding me right now? The mean customer bellowed, throwing up his hands. We just saw people get their throats ripped out, and you're talking about cold medicine? We need to know what the hell is going on here. The girl shared a look that clearly expressed disdain for his tone. On the way up here. We heard on the news that there were riots breaking out around the country, the man from the cereal aisle piped up. Maybe some of those rioters have made their way up from Savannah or down from Charleston? I don't know what kind of riots you've been in, boy, the jerk cried. But last time I checked, rioters don't typically eat people. Yelling is getting us nowhere, Grace cut in, holding out her hands. We need to be productive and figure out how to get out of this. now." Does anybody have a cell phone? As everyone fumbled in their pockets, she straightened up. Dante patted his pocket but shook his head. 
Must have left it at the hotel, he said, shrugging at Grace. I got nothing, the guy from the cereal aisle said, sighing. Grace furrowed her brow. Can't get a call through? No, I mean, I got nothing, he replied, holding up his phone screen for her to see. No service. The mean customer growled and smacked his phone before slamming it down on the lunch table. You know, I bought this at your store, he snapped, pointing at Bailey, as she turned around with a bottle of cough medicine. Why the hell isn't it working? She stared at him like a deer caught in the headlights, frozen. So that's how you respond to a screwed customer, he demanded. Silence! Why isn't this working? Grace slammed her hands down on the table. Hey, dipshit, she snarled. Does she look like a cell phone technician? He blinked at her, too in shock the woman was speaking to him that way. Did I fucking stutter? She snapped. Does she look like a cell phone technician? He shook his head and stammered. Um, no. No, she doesn't, does she? She said firmly, standing up. Now, why don't you quit whining like a spoiled five-year-old and start helping us figure out our next move? He lowered his gaze, wilting underneath her tone. Bailey gave her a thankful look and handed the cough medicine to the cereal aisle woman, who offered a smile in response. Let's start simple, Grace continued, now in control of the room. I'm Grace, that's my brother Dante, and this lovely Supercenter employee is Bailey. I'm Connor, the cereal aisle man piped up as he shoved his useless phone back into his pocket. And this is my wife June. She gave a little wave before dissolving into more coughs fumbling with the package of pills. Everyone glanced at the asshole customer who rolled his eyes and crossed his arms. Fine, he drawled. I'm Troy, 42, and an investment banker from New York City that makes more in a week than all of you combined in a year. Now, if we're done with this first day of kindergarten bullshit, can we kindly figure out what the fuck is going on? Dante cocked his head in Bailey's direction. You've been here all morning, haven't you? he asked, and when she nodded, he motioned for her to speak. Do you know what happened with the attack earlier? I was in the back when it happened, so I didn't see it, she admitted, shaking her head. There was just a scream and then a panicked call over the radio for security to come up to the front. After a couple of minutes, the manager came on and told everyone to stay in their sections. I just thought another customer was throwing a temper tantrum. She glanced at Troy, tonguing her cheek. Which seems to be quite common in these parts. Before he could get riled up, Dante turned to the young couple. And you two, he said. Were you here when it happened? Yeah, June choked out, swallowing two pills dry. We were near the back when we heard the commotion. We didn't think anything of it and just kept shopping. Troy rolled his eyes. Nice situational awareness there, he scoffed. We both spent time in retail hell, she shot back, narrowing her eyes at him. We know the kind of shit that goes on. If we had a dollar for every time we heard someone lose their shit at the cashier, we'd be rich enough to own the place. Bailey nodded in silent agreement, suddenly looking tired. Dante peered out the window, pulling back the shade just a hair, so he wouldn't give them away. Most of the corpses had moved away from the door. A few of them sprinting up the aisle, he wondered if they'd spotted another poor soul, but couldn't be sure. A creature staggered towards the door, wearing a bloodied supercenter uniform. He looked closely, seeing it had a bite on the back of its leg and shoulder, as well as a few other places. He shook his head. Zombies, he muttered under his breath, disbelieving. Really? The fuck you just say? Troy barked. Nothing, he said, waving a dismissive hand. Troy pointed a finger at him angrily. Bullshit! You said zombies, he declared. Are you fucking kidding me right now? There was a tense silence in the room as everyone tried to process that information. Dante, Grace said slowly, confused at her normally level-headed brother. Did you really say zombies? He nodded, stepping away from the window. Yeah, I did, he admitted. You sure those burns on your face didn't cook your brain a bit? June asked dryly. 
He ignored her barb, shaking his head. I know how it sounds, he replied. But between ripping off that EMT's jaw and Bailey's co-worker who we saw get ripped to shreds running around, I don't know what else to call them. Regardless, it doesn't matter what they are. What matters is that they're fast, vicious, and if we're going to have any chance of getting out of here alive, we're going to need weapons. Troy stared down his nose at Bailey. So, do you know where the gun section is, sweetheart? His voice dripping with condescension. She shook her head. There is no gun section at this store. Are you fucking kidding me? He threw up his hands. This is South Carolina. How in the holy hell is there not a gun section? Apparently, too many rich New Yorkers vacationed on the island and complained to the manager about it, she snapped, putting her hands on her hips, finally having enough of his antics. Something about offending their sensibilities, so he had it removed last year. He huffed and threw himself down into a chair. Okay, so what do you have here that we can use to defend ourselves? He asked petulantly. Baseball bats, Dante cut in. When everyone turned to him, eyes wide, he spread his arms. They're compact, lightweight, and can crush a skull if you hit it just right. Troy rolled his eyes. Oh, here we go again with the zombie bullshit, he drawled. I suppose you think we need to destroy the brain or something. Well, Dante scratched the back of his head, looking embarrassed. I already tried ripping the jaw off of one of them, and the thing didn't so much as flinch. Pretty sure whatever these things are, they don't care about pain. So if you want to try and gut-punch them, you have at it. I'm aiming straight for the dome. One thing I've learned over my years of training is that if you hit anything in the head hard enough, it goes down, regardless of what it is. Troy contemplated for a moment, and then begrudgingly nodded. Bailey? Where is the sporting goods section? Grace asked. She swallowed hard. About six aisles down to the left, she said, motioning. Bats should be in the middle of the aisle. At least they were in my store. Okay, Troy, Dante said, rubbing his palms together. You ready to do this? The banker blinked at him incredulously. Fuck you if you think I'm going back out there willingly, he scoffed. I'm content sitting my happy ass here until the cavalry comes. This shit just started twenty minutes ago. The EMTs are already wiped out, we're outnumbered, and the cell network has collapsed, Connor said, getting to his feet. I'm gonna go out on a limb and assume help ain't coming. Grace nodded. Connor's right, she agreed. We gotta get out there and get weapons so we can fight our way out. Well, if he's so right then let him go out there and risk his skin, Troy snapped. June coughed and shook her head. My hubby is a lot of things, but a fighter ain't one of them, she wheezed. A hell of a stiff breeze can knock him flat on his ass. Well, that's obvious if he's letting you do all the fighting for him, Troy said dismissively, waving her off. What kind of man does that, huh? Connor's eyes darkened. The kind of man that knows she has a bigger dick than anybody in this room, he declared. And she'll gladly fuck you with it if you don't lay off. June glared at the banker, and he withered under her intense stare. So, what do you say? Dante asked regarding Troy. You want to man up and help me out? Or do we get to sit back and watch June bend you over a table? The banker's eyes flashed but he bit his tongue and got up from the table. All right, hot shot. Let's get this over with so I can go on my way and never have to look at your ugly mug again. Fine by me, Dante replied. You follow my lead. You good with that? He asked. Yeah, whatever, Troy muttered. Grace reached out and grabbed Dante's hand, drawing her lower lip between her teeth and looking up at him with sad eyes. Brother, you be safe out there she said. He winked at her with his good eye and smirked, playfully motioning to his face. When have you ever known me to play it safe? She forced a smile. Just try, she whispered. For me? 
He nodded and then turned to the group. Now listen, he said. There's a good chance we're going to be coming in hot, so you be ready to slam this door as soon as we're through. He looked at June. Can you be ready to help? he asked gently. She coughed but gave him a thumbs up. Don't worry, she replied. My fat ass will make sure that door stays shut. Dante blushed a little. My apologies. I wasn't implying. Ah, honey, she replied, waving him off. You ain't got nothing to apologize for. I know what I am, and frankly, it's about damn time I put it to good use. He nodded at her, glad she hadn't taken it personally, especially considering his own physical traits that got addressed all the time. Okay, we move quick and silent, he said, turning to Troy. If there's trouble in the aisle, I'll handle it while you grab the bats. Once they're in hand, we'll haul ass back here to regroup. You good with that? The banker rolled his eyes. Yeah, yeah, he drawled. Let's get this done. Dante snapped his fingers. Hey, he stared him down. Are you good with that? Yes, I'm good, Troy said firmly. Satisfied, Dante turned to his sister. You'll be ready for us, he said, and peeked out the window once more. The immediate coast was clear, so he cracked open the door, and he and Troy slid out of the break room as silently as they could. Chapter 3 Dante led Troy away from the break room, taking slow, quiet steps towards the sporting goods aisle. He looked across, seeing a sign on top of one of five aisles down that red, baseball, basketball, soccer. He pointed and looked back at his companion, who nodded. He paused at the end cap, peering down to see if the coast was clear. He motioned for Troy to follow him and then darted across to the next end cap. The next one was clear, and when he stopped at the third, he spotted three zombies feasting away on a helpless, twitching victim. The creatures munched away, tearing flesh from bone, their meal convulsing as the last of their life left their body. Dante turned to Troy and held up three fingers, and then put one to his lips to signal there were three ghouls, and they needed to be silent. Troy nodded, eyes wide and then they moved as quickly as they could across the way, keeping their footfalls as silent as possible. Dante checked the next one, and glanced back at his companion, who was checking to make sure the feasting corpses hadn't noticed them. He gave a thumbs up, and so they moved up to the final aisle. Dante looked down and spotted a lone zombie standing near the bats. He turned and nodded to Troy, holding up one finger. They shared a firm nod, and then Dante made the turn, creeping up the aisle. The zombie stood transfixed by a light glaring off of a metal display, moaning and clawing at it. Dante kept his eye on the ghoul, and the baseball bats on the shelf between them. If I can reach one of those, then we're in business, he thought. But when he was within five steps of the equipment, the ghoul turned towards him, letting out a growl and sprinting forward. Get the bats! Dante bellowed and rushed the zombie, lowering his shoulder. He hit it in the gut and wrapped his arms around its knees, flinging it onto its back. He put his entire weight into his knees, pinning its chest, and held its face down by the throat with his strong hand. Despite his strength, he was having a hard time holding the thing down. For a corpse, it was strong as a bucking bronco. Hurry up and brain this thing, he yelled, and Troy finally reached the rack of bats. Two more zombies tore around the corner at the top of the aisle towards the main part of the store and rushed towards them. The banker's eyes widened, and he stood there for a second with his armload of bats. Sorry, man, he finally cried, and then turned tail, running back towards the break room. Dante let out a frustrated growl, looking at the two zombies rushing for him. They were gaining ground quickly, and he knew he wouldn't have time to escape. He pushed off of the zombie's head, giving him an extra second to grab a bright pink baseball bat from the rack. He whipped around and brought it down vertically, smashing in the top of the ghoul's head as it scrambled to its feet. It collapsed on the ground in a heap, and he turned towards the other two that were within ten yards now. He darted forward, 
leaping into the air and delivering a flying knee strike to the lead zombie's chest, sending it crashing to the linoleum. As he landed on his feet, he immediately swung, cracking in the skull of the second zombie. The fallen ghoul managed to get back to its feet quickly, turning around just in time for Dante to use the bat like a lance, smashing it into its face. The bones in the zombie's face shattered with a crunch, its nose completely flattened, and it staggered back a few steps. It moaned and lunged towards him, but he gave it another quick jab to the face. This time, as the zombie tripped backwards, he hit it in the face a third time, and then wound up, smacking down on top of its head. With the three corpses unmoving on the floor, Dante looked back towards the top of the aisle, seeing no other immediate threat. He rushed to the back wall, heart hammering as he paused at each aisle, looking down to check for enemies. With the amount of noise he'd made, he couldn't get sloppy now. The first few aisles were still empty, as was the one that had had the feasting zombies in it. Even the corpse they'd been feeding on was gone. When he reached the break room hallway, he peered around the corner at the sound of moaning and banging. Two creatures stood outside the door, which was still open a crack, pounding on it with their bloody hands. Dante looked both ways, making sure there wasn't anything else waiting to ambush him. When he saw it was clear, he headed for the door, gripping the gaudy baseball bat tightly. The first zombie didn't see him coming, and he caved in the top of its head from behind. The second one tried to turn, but its arm was caught in between the door and the frame, so it was unable to launch an attack. The hallway was wide enough that Dante was able to swing the bat normally, the impact forceful enough to crack the creature's skull and snap its neck. Its arm caught in the door with such force that the body just laid there, limp. The head slumped to one side. Grace, Dante said. The door flung open and he stepped over the body. June shoved the dead creature away and slammed the door, throwing the deadbolt and pressing her back up against it. Oh my God, are you okay? Grace cried, rushing over to him. Dante's eyes narrowed. I'm fine, he said flatly, staring at Troy in the corner. The banker looked ferociously terrified, though seemingly trying to hide to save his macho man attitude, not wanting to show weakness. Dante threw the pink aluminum bat on the floor with such force that the clang echoed loudly in the small room. He stalked over to Troy, not blinking, not breaking eye contact. He stopped six inches away, but didn't reach out to even lay a finger on him. You should know this, he said, voice calm and collected, but injected with venom. I have broken men in half, who have done far less to me than what you just did. As fate would have it, I happen to need you right now. He cocked his head. However, and you listen to this good. If you pull anything even remotely close to what you just did, I won't have a need for you any more. Do you understand what I'm saying? Troy clenched his teeth tightly and just gave a jerky nod in response. What happened out there? Connor asked, brow furrowing. Dante continued to stare at Troy, making sure that the man knew he wasn't fucking around. When he was convinced, he gave him a slight nod to remind him who was in charge, and then turned back to the rest of the group. What happened is we got the bats and took down a few zombies, he declared. Connor shook his head. No, what happened? That's the only thing that matters, Dante cut in firmly. Question is, June piped up, swiping her palms together as she moved away from the door. Now that we got weapons, what in the hell do we do now? I mean, I would say you all could come over to our place, but... I'm not sure our little trailer is going to offer much protection from those things. Bailey shook her head, wringing her hands. I need to get home to my family, she said shakily. My mother is home alone with my two younger sisters. They've got to be scared out of their minds right now. Where are they? Dante asked. She chewed her lip. They're in Beaufort. Beaufort? Connor howled, shaking his head. Hell, girl, that's like thirty miles away, and it's pretty big, too so there's probably going to be a ton of those suckers running around. Going to be a madhouse. Bailey stepped forward, pressing her palms together. 
But the marine base is there, she insisted. They've got to be holding things together, don't they? Shit. With as quickly as this stuff is spreading, Connor replied. I'm not sure anybody is going to be able to get a handle on it. Bailey swallowed hard, hugging her arms across her chest, and then burst into tears. June pursed her lips and walked over to the young woman, putting an arm around her shoulders. God damn it, Connor. Cut that shit out, she snapped, and then turned to Bailey. Don't worry. I'm sure the Marines are getting your mom and sisters right now. It's going to be okay. Bailey nodded, sobs subsiding a little as she let the other woman comfort her. Dante took a deep breath. I promise we'll get to your family. But right now we need to get someplace safe, he explained. Thirty miles into a populated area is going to be tough, and staying here certainly isn't an option. If enough of those things realize we're in here, we'll never get out of this room. So, where can we go? Grace asked, brow furrowing. Troy cleared his throat, stepping away from the corner raising his chin. You people can do whatever you want, he declared, but I'm going back to Hilton Head Island. Dante and his sister shared a glance, surprised that the asshole had actually had a good idea. One bridge on and off the island, Grace mused, should be easily defended. He cocked his head. You assume that the interior of the island would be clear? Oh, I would wager every dime of my considerable fortune that it is, Troy said, crossing his arms. Or it soon will be. Yeah? June asked, stifling a cough. What makes you so damn sure? Two words, Troy replied, holding up two fingers. Theo fucking Atkinson. There was a moment of silence as everyone thought over the name. June dissolved into a fit of coughs, wheezing under her breath. <clears throat> that was three words. Who in the hell is Theo? Connor began, and raising his hand into air quotes, fucking Atkinson. Grace put a hand to her forehead. Wait, I know that name, she said, staring at the ceiling to try to remember. Why do I know that name? Everyone thought for another moment. And then, finally, it clicked for Dante, and he shook his head. As the mercenary guy, isn't it? He asked slowly, not impressed. Grace gasped, finally remembering. That motherfucker is evil as hell, she cried. Do you have any idea how many of his mercenaries from QXR Group have committed war crimes, while getting paid by our tax dollars, no less? I've protested a couple of times outside one of his offices in Seattle. Dude is a prick and a half. I couldn't care less about supposed war crimes in third world shitholes, Troy replied with a shrug. What I do care about is that his boys kick all kinds of ass, so I can guarantee they got that bridge blocked off and have that island under control. Grace looked helplessly at Dante, who was innately and begrudgingly accepting the plan as the most logical option. Dante, she pleaded, pressing her palms together. He sighed, running his hands over his head. I know, I know, he groaned. I'm not exactly thrilled with this plan either. But if this stuff is widespread, it might be our only hope of riding this out. She shook her head, lowering her hands and clenching her fists at her side. So, how do we know this Theo dude is on the island? June asked, finally clearing her throat. Troy jutted out his chin. Because I was teeing off on the 16th hole when he was flying into the island airport, he explained. Big old bitch of a plane. Forget private jets, he was travelling like he was about to invade a small country. Guess that's good enough, June replied dryly. Connor raised his palms. Having a destination is fine and all, but how in the hell are we getting there? He demanded. Weather might be nice, but not sure this is a great day to be going on a five-mile hike. We would say you could ride with us, June added, wrinkling her nose. But our car is kind of trashed. Her husband nodded. Plus, the starter goes out half the time, he explained. And with our luck, it would definitely go out when we're fleeing zombies or whatever the hell those things are. The group turned to Troy, and he shrugged. High-end sports car, he replied. So I can fit one. Grace rolled her eyes least surprising revelation of the day. 
So, just by looking at me, you know I like the finer things in life? He asked, shooting her a smug smile. June held up a hand. No, it means one look at you and we know you have a pecker the size of a little smoky. Troy growled, but Dante stepped forward, speaking loudly to get things back on track. Bailey, what about you? He asked. She shook her head. A friend dropped me off, she replied quietly. My mother needed the car today. Well, I guess that leaves us then, Dante said with a shrug. We have a sedan. It's going to be a tight fit, but we can all get in. Troy sneered. So, what's the plan, hotshot? He asked. Dante took a deep breath and paced a bit, thinking. Does the vestibule at the front of the store lock without a key? He asked. Yes, there is a bolt switch that you can hit at the bottom of the doors, Bailey replied, brow furrowing. Why? Because we don't know what the outside is going to look like, he explained. If we can get into the vestibule and lock it down, we can catch our breath for a minute before going out. She nodded, catching his drift. The interior doors lock from both sides, and the door to the outside obviously only locked from the inside, she said. The interior door locks are hidden so you have to feel along the base for a pop-out switch. If you go straight along the panel, straight down from the handle, you can't miss it. Dante stopped pacing, listening intently. Good to know, he replied with a nod. Since you know what you are looking for when we get in there, that's all I want you to focus on. Troy and I will handle any of those things that are inside that area. The rest of you, find locks and flick them shut. Everybody good with that? he asked, and everybody nodded. Then grab a bat, because it's time to get out of here. Chapter 4 Dante looked out the window of the break room, confirming that the hallway was clear. There were no zombies in the aisle directly ahead of them. Troy, I want you to take the rear, he instructed. Everybody else, file in. The group got into position, with Grace right behind him, the redneck couple behind her, and Bailey in front of Troy. Dante threw open the door, bat in hand, and led them down the hallway, carefully and quietly stepping over the corpses still laying there. They inched their way up to the corner, and he poked his head out, looking both ways. The coast was clear along the back of the store. He led them all the way up the aisle, stopping at the top to peek around. The main aisle that ran horizontally across the store was just to the left of them. The front aisle was a good fifty or sixty yards to the right, with a whole lot of housewares aisles in between. There would be no easy way for them to cut through the middle of the store, so they'd have to risk going up the main front aisle. Dante looked further down the left side, seeing a handful of creatures along the outer wall, a good sixty yards from them. He motioned to the ground that it was time to move. He led them out, darting across the open area and taking some semblance of cover against a large shelving unit as they worked their way towards the front of the store. Dante approached a break in the structure, leading down a small aisle. He peeked around the corner and found himself staring at the back of a zombie's head, not more than an arm's length away. He reacted on instinct, grabbing it by the back collar, spinning it around and slamming its face into the ground. As it thrashed, Grace quickly used the top of her bat to cave its head in with several quick blows. The brother and sister shared a relieved look, eyes wide at how close that had been. The rest of the group held their collective breath, listening intently for any noise. There was moaning coming from a few side aisles down, where some of the things had caught on to their position. Dante and Grace quickly slid back behind cover, and he peered down the row. Three zombies emerged, jerking their heads around in an attempt to figure out where the food was. After several tense moments, two of them wandered back down where they'd come from, but one remained about ten yards away. Dante held up a finger to let the group know that there was still one ghoul there, and then waved for them to follow. He led them across the opening, moving quickly and quietly. As Connor stepped over the corpse, he was more concerned with the zombie ahead, and his foot caught the dead one's wrist. As he shook it free, the watch adorning its wrist blinked on the ground. 
The tiny noise was enough to catch the attention of the zombie, and it turned, moaned, and ran towards him. June threw up her hands, but he shoved her aside out of harm's way. He tried to lift the bat to strike, but the creature hit him too quickly, tackling him and driving them both into the grocery section across the main aisle. They hit the floor hard, and the ghoul latched onto his cheek, ripping it clean off. He screamed in pain, and June shrieked his name, lunging towards him. Troy caught her waist and shoved her after Grace. He's gone. Move, he yelled, giving her another shove. The other two zombies that had deserted were back, and he spotted them as they closed in. Fuck, he muttered. Bailey raised her bat, but she could barely hold it steady. Eyes wide with fear. In a split-second decision, Troy grabbed her and pulled her away from the opening, heading in the opposite direction of the other three in the group. Bailey! Grace shrieked, but Troy dragged her to safety, moving down the centre main aisle and vanishing around the corner. The two zombies rushed out for food, and Dante grabbed June and jerked her after him and his sister. In a matter of seconds, the two creatures spotted their buddy feasting on Connor, who twitched on the floor, whimpering and losing life fast with each bite and tear. June clamped her hands over her mouth, tears streaming down her face, but not making a noise. Dante motioned that they needed to keep moving, so Grace grabbed the heartbroken woman's arm and pulled her along after them. June shook her off and readied her bat, giving a firm nod. The trio moved up the side aisle, running parallel with the aisle running to the front of the store. There were signs of struggle and death, various housewares scattered about the ground resting in pools of fresh blood. Dante worked the group up to the front, stopping them at the top of an aisle just off to the side of the front registers. Past those, about twenty yards away, was the vestibule, which had a few zombies in it. There were four ghouls also scattered about the checkout line, with a few more milling about in the clothing section directly across from the registers. The vestibule itself was small, with four doors on the exterior leading to four interior doors straight ahead. Two on the smaller interior wall were for people to exit, after completing their purchases. Dante studied everything thoroughly before whispering to his companions. We're going for the side doors, he said quietly. I'll take out the two zombies inside. You two get it locked up. Grace gave him a thumbs up, and he looked back out, taking a deep breath, ready to make his move. Before he could step out, however, his sister grabbed his arm, stopping him. He spun around and saw she was holding up a solid metal garlic press. He furrowed his brow, not understanding what she wanted him to do with it. She leaned in and whispered, Throw it into the clothing section. It might draw some of the ones away from the register. He nodded, impressed with her idea, and took the handheld press. He reared back and then flung it as hard as he could over the shelving. A few seconds later there was a loud clang as it bounced off one of the metal display racks. He watched as most of the zombies in the register area immediately rushed off towards the noise, moaning and thrashing as they went. This left only two in the register area, and two in the vestibule. Dante led them out, the three of them running hard. They reached the register area and one of the zombies spotted them. It moaned and started rushing but Dante didn't stop moving at full speed. As they prepared to crash into each other, he ducked down, planting his shoulder into its gut, picking it up and throwing it onto one of the checkout baggage areas. It hit hard, before sliding off into the area where the cashier would have stood. While this happened, June ran forward, straight at a zombie near the double vestibule doors. It turned and started to come at her, but she managed to crack it on the head with her bat, dropping it to the ground. She swung several times, sending blood splatter onto herself and everywhere else. Grace and Dante caught up to her, with Grace touching her shoulder to get her to calm down and focus. She nodded, and they continued on to the vestibule, about ten yards away. Dante flew through the doors first, immediately heading towards the two zombies at the far end. They quickly turned when the door opened and rushed at them. So he lowered his shoulder and slammed into the lead ghoul's chest, driving it back into the other. They crashed into the back wall and flopped to the ground, giving Dante a brief moment to deliver strikes with his bat. 
he swung swiftly and violently, giving half a dozen strikes in rapid succession. With them thrashing on the ground, it was hard to see if he was making clean hits or not, so he kept going until they stopped moving. As soon as they were down, he turned his attention to the outer doors, finding the locks and getting them shut tight. While he was battling, June focused on the doors they'd just come through, finally getting them locked. Grace rushed over to the two sets of double doors leaning into the store, frantically running her hand down the panel and trying to find the secret release. When she finally found it, she popped it out and secured it. When she moved over to the second one, she popped it out, but then froze at the sight of Troy and Bailey running towards her, several zombies hot on their heels. As they blew through the clothing section, several more corpses darted out and joined the pursuit. Grace's eyes widened. She didn't want to lock the door in case they could make it. She held steady, watching as they ran hard towards her. To the left, she spotted one of the zombies from the register area, running on an intercept course, and threw open the door, darting out. Grace! Dante screamed, but she ignored him, taking a few steps away from the door and swinging her bat hard, catching the ghoul in the torso and sending it staggering back. Troy and Bailey flew through the door. Hurry up, girl! Troy barked, and Grace quickly leapt back inside the vestibule, pulling the door shut just in time. A dozen zombies smacked into the glass, and Troy and Grace struggled to keep it shut as Bailey fumbled for the lock. Hold it steady! she screamed. We're fucking trying! Troy bellowed back. The door shook violently and she tried to time the lock turn just right so that the bolt would slide into place. Finally, there was a satisfying click of metal on metal, and the door was secure. The duo tentatively let go of the door, taking a step back to make sure it was going to hold against the smacking angry monsters on the other side. It did, and the three of them breathed a sigh of relief. Troy patted Grace on the back. That was one hell of an assist there, he said sounding genuine for the first time since they'd met. Dante crossed his arms, and one major heart attack on my part, he added darkly. Sorry, Grace said, avoiding his gaze. I saw that thing was going to take them out, and I just reacted. Didn't have time to think, just went into action. Bailey ran her hands over her disheveled ponytail. I didn't even see it. Only reason I did was because she took it out, Troy replied. Dante took his sister's arm, turning her to face him. Are you okay? I'm fine, she said firmly, jutting out her chin and finally looking up at him. I am capable of fighting, you know. He just took a deep breath. I know. It's just... He sighed. I know. He didn't have the words to put the situation in perspective, so he dropped it. With the sudden silence, June's racking sobs in the corner overtook the space and the girls rushed over to her for comfort. Good job keeping her safe, Dante said quietly to Troy. The banker forced a smirk. See, I'm not a total asshole. Come on, we're not out of this yet, Dante said, chuckling, and gave him a playful punch in the arm. They joined the others by the front window, and the sight of the parking lot took their breath away. It looked apocalyptic outside. There was an overturned car at the top of the parking lot, with several zombies crowded around it. There were also a handful of ghouls mingling in between the cars, though thankfully, none had come up to the front of the store. So, which car is yours? Bailey asked. Grace inclined her head. The shitty green sedan on the right side, there, she said. It doesn't look so bad, June said through her sniffles, voice thick. Dante rolled his eyes. She wanted the convertible, he teased. That would have been perfect for this time of year, Troy pointed out. You know, without the whole end-of-the-world thing. Grace glanced at her brother with a sly smile, her eyes saying, See, I told you so. Yeah, yeah, I know, he groaned. Weather is different in other parts of the country. June got to her feet, straightening her shoulders and wiping her eyes. So, how are we doing this? she asked. They studied the soon-to-be battlefield, scanning the several zombies by the cars. Grace angled her view out the front windows to see the left and right. 
I'm not seeing anything to the sides, but I can't get a great angle, she said. There may be some by the front walls, but I can't be sure. We'll just have to check when we exit, Dante replied. Grace, you and June handle our flanks. If it's one, take it out. If it's more, call for help. They nodded firmly, tightening their grips around their bats. Troy, you and I are going straight for the car, Dante continued. We need some time to get everybody in, so we're probably going to have to take those things down. The banker nodded. All right, he agreed. You lead the way. I'll brain whatever you don't. Dante offered him a smile, thankful that the asshole finally seemed to be on board. Okay, let's do this. Chapter 5 Dante and Troy stood by the front doors, ready to do battle to get them to the cars. Bailey knelt down beside them, reaching over with her hand on the lock. Just tell me when, she said. You ready? Dante asked, turning to his partner. Ready as I am ever going to be, Troy replied. Dante nodded. Unlock it, he said, and Bailey complied. It clinked open, and as soon as she moved her arm, the two men burst out of the store, sprinting towards the cars. The others piled out next, June and Grace checking the flanks. One ghoul on June's side spotted them and came forward at a run. She stopped dead in her tracks, raised the bat above her head, and jutted out her chin. Come on, motherfucker! she yelled, and then cracked it over the top of the head, dropping it in a single blow. She didn't hesitate after killing it, rushing after the rest of the group. There were about a dozen cars in the parking lot, Dante's vehicle at the far end on the right side. As the two men grew close, their footsteps attracted the ghouls in their direction. Troy swung at a young-looking zombie, no more than twenty, missing several chunks of flesh from its neck and face. The bat caught it in the side of the head, sending the frail creature tumbling head over heels. Dante saw two zombies running towards him from the next aisle, but kept rushing to the sedan. He hopped up onto the truck and clambered over the top of the hood. The zombies reached him, but he was able to keep enough distance that they couldn't bite him. From this vantage point, he smacked down the ghouls one after the other, cracking their skulls. Dante looked over and saw Troy confronting another zombie. It ran up on him quick, and he couldn't get a clean swing at it. So he used his large frame to pick the smaller corpse up and pile-drive it into the pavement face first. Even at ten yards away, Dante heard the telltale crack of the neck snapping. He watched the trio of women getting closer, and then looked over at the road. Some of the car crash crowd had broken away from the wreck and sprinted across the lot towards them. We got incoming, he bellowed. Troy glanced over, seeing the new threat about forty yards away. Well, come the fuck on then, he yelled, raising his bat. Dante hopped down from the car and rushed over, pulling out the keys and hitting the unlock button correctly this time. Everybody reached the vehicle, with Troy hopping in the front seat and the girls clambering into the back. They slammed the door shut, and a few seconds later, rotted hands smacked into the glass. Bailey jumped, afraid of the zombies that smeared crimson all across the back window, teeth gnashing at the glass, trying in vain to get through. Sometime today, Dante, Troy cried, flinching away from the window. Dante finally got the keys in the ignition and started up the car. He flipped it into gear and floored it. The tires squealed as much as they could on a late model sedan, and then lurched forward out of the space. There were a few zombies on the hood, and he swerved back and forth to throw them off. When he reached the driveway, he stopped, looking both ways. What the hell are you waiting on? Troy demanded, throwing his hands up. Pretty sure you aren't going to get a ticket if you blow through the stop sign. Dante didn't respond, simply looking to the west, away from the island. There were zombies everywhere congregating around a multi-car pile-up near another of the shopping centre exits. He finally snapped back to it and made the turn. He picked up a bit of speed but kept it manageable, about thirty miles an hour, as he focused solely on driving. The others watched the landscape roll by in horror. There was a wreck on the side of the road with two zombies actively pulling a driver out of the car. He thrashed and screamed while being eaten alive. Down the street, a little further, a pack of zombies chased a poor soul 
frantically firing a handgun back in his pursuer's direction, missing badly. "'Isn't there anything we can do?' Bailey moaned through her fingers. "'Yeah, we can survive,' Troy replied flatly. She fell silent, overwhelmed with helplessness, fear for the victims and for her family. When they were within a couple of miles of the bridge, Troy yelled, "'Watch it!' A small pack of zombies darted out from the side of the road, smacking into the vehicle. Dante wasn't able to get it out of the way in time, so one of them flipped over the passenger side bumper, crashing into the windshield and cracking it, leaving a blood-stained spiderweb behind. Doesn't look like you're getting your deposit back, Troy muttered, uncurling his fingers from the handle above his head. Dante shook his head. That's why I always pay for the extra insurance, Troy chuckled trying to diffuse his tension as they continued down the road. One mile from the bridge, they hit trouble. There was a moderate pile up on the road, half a dozen cars with one flipped completely over. Dante slammed on the brakes and a pack of ten zombies turned towards them, tearing their way. Just plow through them, Troy declared. Dante shook his head firmly. And then what? he asked. This car isn't making it through that wreck. He looked to the median seeing that there was a small metal barrier so they couldn't cross over. He threw the car in reverse. What are you doing? Troy cried. There was a crossover a mile back, Dante grunted. We'll get on the other side and make our way up. Wait, June cried, and he stopped the car. What do you see? he asked, brow furrowing. June tapped on the window. Apartment complex, on the right, she said. They have to have multiple exits, right? she asked. The men shared a glance and shrugged. Good enough for me, Dante said, and threw the car back into drive, quickly speeding into the complex. The parking lot was a bigger mess than the highway. Carnage everywhere, zombies running around, bodies scattered everywhere. Just a bad day. He drove fast, treating the speed bumps like ramps, flying through the air a bit. As they came around a corner, he was forced to slam on the brakes when another car appeared from one of the side alcoves. The other driver didn't slow down, smashing into the front of the car hard, spinning them around and sending shattered glass everywhere. Dante was stunned for a moment before snapping back to it. He looked around, checking out his passengers. Is everybody okay? he asked. There was a chorus in the affirmative, and then he unclipped his seatbelt, staggering out of the car. He shook his head to regain his wits and looked at the other car. The driver wasn't wearing a seatbelt and was halfway out of the windshield, a massive pool of blood forming on the hood. He didn't spend long focused on that, as he heard moaning and loud footsteps coming from behind him. He looked down the complex, spotting a couple dozen zombies rushing towards them, about fifty yards away and closing. "'Come on, we gotta move!' he barked. "'We gotta move!' The urgency in his voice got the group moving, quickly getting out of the car and to their feet. They saw the threat quickly closing in on them, and panicked, frantically looking around for options. "'Got an open door over here!' Grace cried. "'Go! Now!' Dante yelled, and they took off towards the open apartment door as quickly as they could. When they reached it, he went first, raising his bat cautiously, unsure of what would be waiting inside. The small one-bedroom apartment was a mess, a clear struggling having taken place. The dining room table was knocked on its side, pans strewn all over the kitchen floor, the stove still on. The rest bustled in and quickly shut the door, locking it as Troy and Dante inched their way towards the bedroom. There were distinct munching and smacking sounds coming from there, and the sickening noises made them tense as they approached. Inside, they found a young woman in her twenties, her blonde hair perfectly quaffed, munching away at a young man on the bed. When they entered the room, the feasting zombie growled and rushed them. Troy didn't waste time delivering a solid strike to the head. Dante walked over to the victim, eyes widening when he realized he was still alive, though barely. The man was covered in bite marks, missing huge chunks of flesh, bleeding out quickly. What do you think? he asked, as Troy came over. I think he needs to be put down before he starts chasing us around in here, the banker replied. Dante gave a solemn nod, knowing he was right. He took a deep breath, hesitating. I can do it if you want, Troy offered softly. Dante shook his head. No, 
Just make sure the others don't come in, he muttered. They don't need to see me do this. Troy nodded and headed out into the hallway. Dante swallowed hard, staring at the man's wide eyes, terrified, knowing that this was the end. I'm sorry, man, he said, shaking his head as he raised his bat. I really am. He drove the bat straight down into the man's forehead, wincing at the crack of his skull as the body went limp. Dante hit him a few more times, just to be sure. When he was satisfied, he turned away with a sick feeling in his stomach and headed out of the room of death. Chapter 6 Grace sat by the window, looking back at the wreck and watching as a dozen zombies continued to congregate around the other driver. She stayed out of sight, not wanting to draw them over. How's it looking out there? June asked quietly, coming up beside her. They all seem distracted by the other driver, Grace murmured. I don't think they saw us come in here, or if they did, they've already forgotten about it. June nodded. Are you hungry? she asked. Grace's eyes nearly popped out of her head. How can you eat at a time like this? she thought, but then shook her head, realizing that it would be a good idea to eat while they had the chance. She patted her stomach. Amazingly enough, I think I am, she said. June nodded and gave her shoulder a squeeze. I'll whip you up something good then, she said. Assuming they weren't New Age health freaks, in which case I'll do my best to make something edible out of soy sausage. She dissolved into a coughing fit and then put a hand to her forehead, straightening up. I'll put a mask on too. Grace smiled appreciatively, though her eyes were tired. As June went to the kitchen, Bailey fiddled around with the remote control, finally clicking it on. There was an old rerun of an 80s sitcom, complete with a laugh track. That hardly seems appropriate, she muttered, given the situation. She clicked around to several different cable stations, all of them showing their regular programming, which made her brow furrow. What is going on? she murmured to herself. Why are they ignoring this? Grace crossed over to her. Most of the cable stations are automated, she suggested, so they have their programming set up in advance. Chances are, nobody is at the controls. Try Channel 12, Jane suggested. Pretty sure it's local. Well, Beaufort, so local enough. Bailey nodded and punched in Channel 12. The screen displayed an empty news studio. There were some scattered papers on the desk, and one of the chairs was missing, but nobody was on the screen. There was no sound coming from the studio either. Maybe they're on a break? she asked, though her voice was shrill and uneasy. A few moments later, one of the anchors, a middle-aged white woman with perfectly styled hair, wandered by the camera. She turned jerkily, revealing dark blood all down the front of her eyes glassy and milky white, mouth open in a hungry snarl. Bailey dropped the remote. We have no news, she said hoarsely. Grace swallowed hard as she stared at the news anchor, and then squinted when she noticed small words scrolling across the bottom of the small TV screen. Wait a second, she said, pointing. Look at the bottom of the screen. She and Bailey moved in closer, reading the white scrolling words. I need help. My name is Katie McClure, and I am trapped in the control room of the TV station. The address is 427 Maple Lane in Beaufort. Please, someone, help me. I'm all alone in here, and there are so many of those things outside the door. That poor woman, Grace breathed, sitting back as the message repeated itself. Bailey clenched her jaw, staring at the screen as if she were looking through it into space. Grace cocked her head. Are you okay? Yeah, just thinking, the younger woman replied, and chewed her lip for a moment. Finally, she snapped her fingers, eyes brightening as she turned to Grace. Wait, I know exactly where that station is. There's not a sign out front anymore, but it's only a few blocks away from my house. If we get to my family, we can get to her as well. Grace didn't want to dampen her spirits 
so she just smiled and nodded, sitting back on the couch. Dante and Troy came out of the bedroom after ransacking it. What's going on? Troy asked. Grace simply motioned to the TV, where the zombie TV anchor thrashed and moaned about. He sighed. Guess that means we're not getting the Knicks score, are we? He asked wryly. It's the Knicks, she replied breezily. They probably lost. His brow furrowed, and he looked like he was going to retort something, but then shrugged. Yeah, that's fair. That's not all, though, Bailey piped up, pointing to the message. Look at the bottom of the screen. Dante tucked a small plastic package he'd brought under his arm and leaned over to look. Man, sucks to be her, Troy murmured, standing back up after reading. Bailey crossed her arms. Wow, such compassion, she snapped, sarcasm evident in her tone. What? I said sucks to be her, Troy replied, shaking his head. I thought that was compassion. Bailey scowled and opened her mouth, but Dante held up a hand. We'll add her to the list, he said but it's way down there. Grace cocked her head, pointing to the plastic package under his arm. What you got there, brother? A gift, he replied, and handed it over. She opened it, eyes widening at the handgun inside. It was loaded with a spare magazine, and she picked it up, inspecting it like an old friend. I mean, if you don't want it, Troy said sheepishly, I'll take it. Dante shook his head. No, Grace is going to be best with it, he said firmly. Troy jutted out his chin. How do you know that? Because I target shoot twice a week, Grace spoke up, checking the chamber expertly. For the last five years, I may not be the best shot, but I'm good enough. Troy chuckled. What's so funny? she challenged. He held up his palms. Just find it ironic that someone that would protest outside of Theo Atkinson's QXR group offices would spend so much time firing a weapon, he said. Nothing ironic about it, Grace replied easily. Guns are fantastic, but it all depends on what you shoot. I fire at paper targets. His people fire at civilians. Not that difficult to see the difference. He shrugged, avoiding her gaze and then sniffed, noticing pleasant smells from the kitchen. "'Are you cooking?' he asked, shock in his eyes as June slid a large portion of scrambled eggs onto a plate. "'Just because the world is ending doesn't mean we get to stop eating,' she quipped, and tossed a few forks onto the counter. "'Grab you a fork and dive in. Might be a while before you get fresh eggs again. Same with bacon, which will be coming up in a minute.' Nobody waited to be asked twice, congregating around the counter and diving in. So what's the plan now? Bailey asked after swallowing her mouthful. Dante smacked his lips, giving June a thumbs up before replying. Depends on how it looks outside. They're still feeding, Grace said, but I can't imagine it will last much longer. Her brother nodded. Well, when they disperse, we're going to make a break for it, he said. The bridge can't be too much farther up, half a mile or so once we get to the other side of the complex. Are you sure there's another exit? Troy asked through a mouthful of egg. Dante shrugged. We didn't pass the front office, and the driveway keeps going up, he explained. Can't imagine they'd have the only entrance so far away from it. Solid enough logic, the banker admitted. Then what are we doing? June asked putting a hand on her hip as she set down a plate of bacon. Dante took a big bite of his eggs before grabbing a slice of bacon. He pointed at Troy with the fried meat. We pray that he's right and that Theo fucking Atkinson has done his job and blocked off the bridge. He bit into the bacon, chewing it slowly and savouring the flavour as they all ate in silence, contemplating what would happen if the bridge wasn't blocked off. Chapter 7 Half an hour later, Grace stood guard at the window, looking out at the wreck. Only a couple of zombies remained hanging out around the cars while the others had wandered off. 
It was difficult to see from her vantage point, but she could see that the driver had started thrashing about, still trapped in the windshield. Dante sidled up next to her, bumping her shoulder playfully with his own. Don't focus too much on the horror, sis, he said softly. Just keep an eye out for an opening to move. Easier said than done, she replied flatly. He nodded, giving her shoulder a reassuring squeeze, and headed back to join the others sitting around the television. After tiring of the news feed, Bailey had changed the channel to a rerun of an 80s sitcom. The group chuckled as one of the characters fell face first into a cake. What are you watching? Dante asked, raising an eyebrow. No clue, Troy admitted. Just something from a simpler time. Not sure when exactly. Just know it is older than four hours. Dante shook his head, chuckling at the light-hearted barb from the surly New Yorker. Before he could sit down to join them, Grace clucked her tongue. I think we can move, she said. Her brother hurried back to the window, looking out to see the zombies by the cars were rushing off in the direction away from the bridge. I don't know what distracted them, he said, but we're going to take advantage of it. He looked to the group as they all stood up and got ready to go. We stay close. Kill what we have to, but the goal is to move as quickly as we can. So if you have to knock them down and keep moving, do that. He turned to his sister. Don't fire that gun unless it's absolutely necessary. One shot from that and we're going to be on every one of those things' radar. She nodded firmly, tightening her grip around the weapon and patting her pocket where the spare mag fits snugly. Troy, I want you up front with me, Dante said, turning to the New Yorker. We may have to plow through these things. He waited for his companion to join him at the door, and then he threw it open. The five of them poured out of the apartment and immediately ran up the main driveway. They reached the wreck, finding the driver that had been shredded by both the windshield and the zombie bites thrashing about. It tried to moan, but it just came out as a gurgle, as it was missing the majority of its neck. Dante motioned for the group to follow him, and they moved up about fifty yards to the next apartment alcove. As they crossed the driveway opening, a trio of zombies spotted them and rushed at them. Dante and Troy stepped up, quickly bashing the first two down, and the latter grabbed the last one by the shirt collar to hold it at bay for Dante to deliver a kill strike. The group continued running and spotted the front office, with the entrance to the complex fifty yards past that. They moved quickly, but when they reached the office, a dozen zombies congregated around the side door and turned towards them. As soon as the first ghoul noticed them, it let out a loud, dead scream and sprinted towards the group. The noise attracted the rest, and within seconds, the entire dozen came at them, mouths open in excitement. Grace, shoot! Dante cried. His sister didn't hesitate, taking aim at the leader and pulling the trigger. The bullet ripped through the forehead of the ghoul, blowing out the back of its skull and dropping it to the asphalt. The others lined up, readying their bats. How do you want to do this? Troy demanded, panic in his voice. Dante inclined his head. We knock them down, they bash their heads, he said quickly. You ladies hear that? June and Bailey echoed a chorus of yeah, and raised their bats. As Grace continued to fire at the back, Dante and Troy lunged at the first few ghouls, swinging their bats at chest level, sending the zombies tumbling to the sides. June and Bailey rushed over to the fallen zombies and smashed with everything they had, June delivering a kill shot on her second swing, but Bailey having a little more trouble. She kept hitting hers in the head, but all it did was knock the corpse back down, not killing it. Finally, she let out a scream and swung with all of her might and adrenaline, cracking the skull and ending its undead life. Grace stepped to the side, aiming carefully and pulling the trigger. With the zombies distracted by the two men, they were easy pickings, not flailing around too much. One by one, she dropped five of them rapidly. There were still four ghouls pressed up against Dante and Troy, who held their bats horizontally and at arm's length to keep them at bay. The creatures thrashed about, smacking them in the face with their wet, gooey hands as they tried to get a bite. On three, push hard and up, Dante grunted. 
Try to hug them under the arms. Troy nodded, catching exactly what his companion wanted to do. One, two, three, Dante cried. And they managed to hook the ghouls and drive them back, sending them crashing to the ground. They immediately began smashing down, cracking the skulls of the zombies as they scrambled to get back to their feet. Within seconds, the immediate threat had ended. The group of five stood there, breathing heavily, spent from the culmination of the morning and this epic battle. Dante looked around at the shocked faces of his companions. Is everyone okay? he asked. One by one, they all sounded off that they were okay. It didn't take long, however, for more moaning and footsteps to echo at them from the complex. Quick, this way, Dante cried, and led the group over to the pool by the front office. He deftly hopped over the four-foot-high fence and went over to the gate release, hitting it so the others could get in. They quickly took cover behind the building, staying quiet. Dante looked out and waited, trying to control his breathing. In thirty seconds or so, a group of twenty to thirty creatures sprinted by the front office, heading off towards a small business park on the other side of the street. When they were clear, he took a knee, relieved. So, are we good? Troy murmured. Dante nodded. Yeah, I think so, he said quietly. They just kept running. I lost sight of them when they crossed over into that business park. Hopefully they keep going so we can get up to the highway. Why the hell didn't they come after us? Troy hissed. Dante shrugged. Maybe they just heard the gunshots and followed it. But without something to hold their attention, they just kept going trying to find it, he replied softly. Whatever the reason, they're not here, and that's all I really care about at the moment. June wheezed and then clapped her hands over her mouth as she started to have a coughing fit. Bailey and Grace huddled around her, trying to muffle the noise, and soon they subsided and she took a deep, ragged breath. Dante looked back out at the road, but the noise, thankfully, hadn't attracted anything. Come on, he whispered. The bridge can't be too much further up. Chapter 8 Dante led the group out of the pool area, with Grace gently shutting the metal gate behind them. As they reached the driveway, he looked towards the business park and his brow furrowed when he saw that the zombies had completely vanished. He motioned for the group to follow him, but Troy grabbed him by the arm, he pointed out a little trail through the woods about ten yards off the driveway. Dante nodded and led them to it, figuring that a little bit of cover would be better than none. They reached the side street hiding behind some trees. Dante scanned the park, finally catching a glimpse of some ghouls. They were at the far end, banging on the door of a small office. Dante had no idea if there was anybody inside, but even if there had been, they wouldn't be able to do anything about it. The side street up to the highway was clear, so he led them out. They walked on the grass to muffle their footsteps, not wanting to take any chances. As they grew closer to the highway, they heard gunshots. It wasn't panic fire, but slow, deliberate shots, one right after the other. Sounds like I was right about Theo Atkinson and his boys. Troy whispered, smirking. Dante pursed his lips. Maybe, he murmured. He led them the rest of the way up the road, stopping at the top of it. They looked towards the bridge and saw that it was fortified. There was a string of cars stretching from one side of the bridge to the other, with several armed men set up along it, all about a quarter mile from where they were. A few dozen bodies lay scattered on the pavement leading up to it. Just follow my lead. Dante whispered. The group nodded in agreement and began to move. Dante stopped short and glanced back at his sister. Grace, holster that, he instructed. We don't want them to think we're hostile. She nodded, putting the handgun in a back waistband and covering it up with her shirt. He raised his hands high, bat in the air, leading them out slowly. The zombies moved fast, and he assumed that if they moved slowly, they'd look as different from the ghouls as possible. 
They walked up about halfway to the barricade, and one of the shooters boomed out. Don't move! We aren't shooting at you! The group froze, and several shots cracked from the barricade. Most of the group flinched, and Bailey screamed. Dante glanced over his shoulder and saw that a few zombies had just been dropped twenty yards behind them. It's okay, he said quietly. They're covering us. Make your way to the checkpoint, the man from the barricade bellowed. Far left of the bridge. Move now, and move quickly. Dante picked up the pace, leading the group over to a makeshift checkpoint on the side of the bridge. The car barricade was a little wonky there, with the final car pushed forward about five feet away from the line, creating a bit of an opening. As he went through, he was greeted by four men in black combat gear, holding high-powered assault rifles, battle-hardened and ready to rumble. They were no nonsense, and didn't use kid gloves as they grabbed the bats away from the group, tossing them to the ground, before shoving all five of them against the concrete barrier. Dante glanced over the edge, seeing deep water below. He studied the area behind the barricade, which was set up like a small campground. There were crates of material stacked behind the line, and a smaller makeshift barricade on the opposite side of the road to prevent a rear attack. All told, there were about twenty men stationed there, keeping a close eye on everything. The four main guards stood a few yards away from the group as the occasional gunshot went off in the distance, taking out yet another zombie. A few tense moments passed before a smarmy-looking twenty-something sauntered up. Well, 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 he drawled, raising his chin. Some more survivors. Didn't think anybody else was going to make it here today. Dante took a deep breath. It wasn't easy, I'll tell you that. The guy looked them up and down, noting that they were coated in blood and looked exhausted. It wouldn't appear so, he said with a sneer. But hey, not everybody can be as well trained as we are. He glanced over at the other three men, who were simply standing there. Well, are you going to get them processed or not? He snapped, waving his hand at them. This island isn't going to clear itself. Get moving. Each of the men pointed at a different person and motioned for them to step up. The fourth guard stepped next to Dante and Bailey, guarding them with his hand on his weapon. They moved slowly, and one of the mercenaries grabbed Grace by the arm and shoved her behind the line. Hey, take it easy, Dante protested. The lead guy whipped around, glaring at him. You stay right there, cowboy, he snarled. You'll have your chance to get felt up in a minute. He looked him up and down. Oh yeah, you look big and strong. You're gonna be put to good use. Bailey and Dante exchanged a concerned look at his choice of words, and the pretentious guy sauntered over to the three about to have their pat down. Okay, listen up, he barked. Bats will turn you into one of those things, so we need to make sure you're not bitten. That means a forceful pat-down. If you refuse, then you're free to leave. Grace looked at Dante with a questioning gaze, but he nodded at her, hoping she'd understand to just roll with it. Before they could start their inspection, June dissolved into a massive coughing fit. All the mercenaries took a step back in shock. The leader held out his palms. What is your blood type? he yelled. She shook her head in confusion as she stifled her coughs, finally calming down. What in the hell are you talking about? She wheezed as she caught her breath. I said, what is your fucking blood type, bitch? The guy barked. June coughed again, putting a fist to her mouth. What the fuck did you just call me? Tell me your fucking blood type now! he demanded. She straightened up finally, glaring at him. It's a positive, motherfucker. What the? The mercenary pulled his handgun and shot her in the face. As she slumped to the ground, her quartet of friends left behind blinking in shock. Grace let out a scream of rage, drawing a handgun from the back of her pants. No! Dante yelled, and the second that the lead mercenary turned to look at him, his face exploded as Grace shot him in the back of the head. The other three raised their weapons, all aiming at Grace, screaming at her to drop the gun. She couldn't do anything, however, because she was frozen with shock, the moment overwhelming her. 
Everybody, calm the fuck down, somebody boomed, and a large man stalked over to the standoff. He stopped five yards away, unarmed. Somebody want to tell me what the hell is going on? Your boy there shot our friend in the face for no reason, Troy yelled, voice shrill. The tall man crossed his arms. No reason, huh? He drawled. Somebody want to expand on that? She had A-type blood, one of the guards said. The man cocked his head. Is that so, huh? He asked, running his tongue over his cheek. And even so, he thought it was a good idea to execute her in front of her friends? I know we have orders to kill, but goddamn, show some fucking common sense, or else you may end up like Zack here. He kicked the dead man's legs. Orders to kill? Troy demanded. Why? The man shook his head. Whatever this virus is, targets people with A-type blood, he explained. All we know is that they get sick, die, and then come back as those things. So our orders are to kill on sight which this dead dumbass took a little too literally. He glanced at Grace, who still stood holding the gun, breaths coming out in panicked pants. Ma'am, I'm sorry about your friend. I really am, he said, tone considerate and gentle. But she was not going to last longer than a day. Now I can't excuse what this man did, but it would appear as though I don't have to, since you dealt with him appropriately. We don't have a wish for more bloodshed, so please, put the gun down. Grace, listen to him, Dante said carefully. These boys mean business, and you're not shooting your way out of this. Please, put it down. She looked at her brother, tears filling her eyes as the gravity of what she'd done took root. She lowered her arm and then, as if in slow motion, laid the gun down on the ground covering her face with her hands. The man walked over and gently picked up the weapon, tucking it into his belt. Thank you, ma'am, he said, as she scrubbed her hands down her cheeks. You can call me no name. May I ask who you are? Her brow furrowed as she stifled her tears. I'm Grace, she said shakily. But you really don't have a name? When you are asked to do the things I've been asked to do, it's best not to have an identity, he replied, especially when there are people I still care about in the world, or at least there were before today. Before he could continue, a grizzled thirty-something man stormed over to them. Goddamn, what the fuck happened to Zack? he barked. He seems to have misplaced his fucking face. He did something stupid and paid for it, no name replied. The angry man planted his hands on his hips. Oh, he did something stupid, did he? What would that be, huh? He demanded, and then spotted June's dead body on the ground. Let me guess. He shot that fat bitch because she was sick, and one of these fuckers took offense. That sound about right? Close enough, no name replied. Then why the fuck haven't these people been put down yet, huh? The angry man bellowed, throwing up his hands. Or are you sweet on this one, you no-name motherfucker? They won't let you have a name, but you think they'll let you have a piece of pussy? Is that it? No name glared at him, jaw tight. Oh yeah, get pissed, big fella, the angry man snarled, smirking. Okay, if that's the way you want it, then so be it. Fuck it. We aren't going to put them down, we're going to put them to work. Boys, slap some cuffs on them, and let's get them processed. Lots of buildings to get cleared. Dante, go! Grace screamed. He didn't want to leave her, but he knew he didn't have a choice. If he wanted to save his friends, he had to be alive and get help. He struck the throat of the guard next to him, causing him to double over and gasp for air. Before the other guards could turn in his direction, he grabbed Bailey and leapt over the edge of the bridge. The young woman screamed the whole way down, and Dante kept a tight hold of her, positioning them so that they'd hit feet first. They splashed down, vanishing underneath the murky waves. Safe at least for the moment. Chapter 9 Dante and Bailey tread water, bruised from their fall from the bridge. He spotted a small island just off of the shore of the main Hilton Head Island. There were several small personal boats that ran up on the shore, 
a few hundred yards away. "'Are you going to make it?' he sputtered. Bailey struggled a bit, trying to keep her head above the cold water. "'Yeah, I think so,' she huffed. He shook his head and grabbed her, flipping her onto her back. He held her arms as she flailed in a panic. "'Don't move,' he said gently. "'Just do your best to float on your back. I'm going to pull you for a bit, okay?' She stopped fighting him, just went with it. She did her best to stay above the water, and he grabbed the back of her shirt collar, pulling her alone while swimming with one arm. This tired him out more than the swimming, but he was bound and determined not to lose another person today. When he started to get tired, still a hundred yards away from the island, he thought about Grace, who was stuck on the bridge with those maniacs. Rage flowed through him, white-hot fire that he'd let Troy convince him it was a good idea. Troy, who was in the same situation as his sister now, You'd better watch over her, he thought bitterly. God help you if you don't. He kept going, his splashes attracting the attention of a young man on the shoreline about fifty yards away from the boat. Lily! Philip! Get over here! he cried. We have some company! Dante watched a young couple join the man, the trio standing on the shore as he found his footing in the soil below. Bailey touched down and then helped him to shore, the two of them collapsing in the sand. Holy shit, are you two okay? The woman, apparently Lily, asked. Where in the hell did you come from? Bailey pointed vaguely back the way they'd come, her arm like lead. We jumped off the bridge, she huffed. Nothing like a little daredevil action to get the blood pumping, Philip quipped. What did you go and do that for? The first young man demanded. Armed assholes tried to shoot us, Dante said through his heaving chest. The trio exchanged concerned looks. God, have they taken the bridge already? Philip asked. Lily rubbed her forehead. It makes sense, given what they're doing on the island. There's more of those guys? Bailey shivered, more from fear than from cold. A lot more, Philip confirmed. At least we think there are. Dante sat up, rage flowing through him even harder than before. The trio stared at him eyes wide at either his anger or his facial injuries. He couldn't be sure. Did... the third guy trailed off. Did they do that to you? Dante's brow furrowed, and he shot an indignant look at him. Lily smacked her companion hard on the arm. Man, what the hell is wrong with you? she snapped. No, they didn't just do that to him. That's just the way he looks. And if you had any common fucking sense, you'd look in the mirror and realize you're in no position to be commenting on appearance. Yeah, what she said, Dante said tiredly. Forgive him, he's an idiot, she continued, turning to the duo. I'm Lily. Bailey offered a tentative smile. I'm Bailey, and this is Dante. The short one over here is Philip, Lily said. The tall moron is Cam. Nice to meet you all. Bailey nodded and then hugged her knees to her chest. If you don't mind me asking, she said slowly, what are you three doing here? We're from the hotel, just across the water, Lily replied. When the shit hit the fan this morning, a group of us got out along with some of the hotel guests. Philip took a deep breath. We thought those things running around were bad, he said, shaking his head. But they were nothing compared to whoever those armed assholes are. They're mercenaries, Dante said flatly. Mercenaries? Cam blurted. On Hilton Head? Long story. That doesn't really matter at the moment. Dante replied, waving him off. What matters is, can I use one of your boats? Lily's brow furrowed. For what? No, 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 Bailey croaked, grabbing his arm, tears swelling up in her eyes. You are not going to the island. I have to get Grace, he said firmly. She clutched him harder. Dante, she pleaded. You are not going to the island. Listen to your girl here, Philip said, pointing at her. You really don't want to go to the island. Dante growled. I don't care how many of them there are, he snapped. I'm going to get over there and find my sister. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, Lily said slowly. She wouldn't make it within fifty yards of the docks. She's right, Cam added. We barely made it out before those assholes started shooting the place up. Even shot at our boats as we got out. Dante clenched his fists and tore away from Bailey peeling himself off of the ground and beginning to pace back and forth. 
She followed him, walking alongside him, trying to catch his eye with her pleading gaze. I know you're upset, she said. We'll get Grace, but right now we need to find someplace safe to get to. He stopped moving, screwing his fists into his eyes for a moment, hating that he felt so helpless. Where is that hotel employee with my lunch? A shrill woman squawked. I was told that there would be lunch on this little unscheduled trip that I was so rudely forced upon. They glanced over at a middle-aged woman, sitting on a log in expensive clothes and oversized sunglasses, fiddling with her phone. And why can't I get any service in this godforsaken place? she demanded, voice like nails on a chalkboard. I thought you people would have made sure I could get cell phone service. Dante blinked at her. Is this bitch for real? he asked. Unfortunately, she is, Lily muttered. Spoiled trust fund kid who never had to work in her life, Cam quipped. So she spends months down here making our lives a living hell. Philip, the woman barked. That's your name, Philip. Where is Philip? I demand to be helped. He shook his head. I'd better go calm her ass down, he said with a sigh. Without manager out of commission, she's just going to carry on until someone appeases her. What happened to your manager? Bailey asked. Cam swallowed hard. One of those crazy people bit him. Is he on the island? Dante demanded, Bailey stiffening beside him. Lily nodded, brow furrowing. Yeah, he came over on one of the boats with us, she replied, jerking a thumb over her shoulder. He was just hurt, but we weren't going to leave him behind. Pretty sure a few of the others were bitten too, Philip added. We can't stay here, Dante said quickly. Cam shook his head. What? Why? Because those bites are infectious as hell, Dante explained. They're deadly and they turn the people who are bitten into those zombie things, whatever they are. The shrill woman continued to scream for Philip. He finally threw up his hands. I'm going to go calm her ass down, he said, turning away. When you figure out where we're going, come get me. Are there any other islands out here? Dante asked. Cam nodded. Yeah, but chances are they're going to be in the same position we are. Bailey opened her mouth, but Dante put up a hand to silence her. I know you want to go home to Buford, he cut in, but we need sparsely populated. I promise I'll get you there, just not right now. She closed her mouth and nodded, sighing but trusting him to keep his word. Sparsely populated, huh? Lily asked. We can go to my cousin's house up in Tillman, Dante shrugged. I'm from Seattle, he said flatly. I have no idea where that is. Hell, I'm from here and have no idea where that is, Bailey added. Not surprising, Lily replied. It's a one-stop sign town with about twelve houses and a gas station. She motioned vaguely with her hands as she spoke. It's on Highway 321, on the other side of the interstate. Can't be more than twenty, twenty-five miles from here. Dante sighed. Sounds great, except for the fact that my rental car got totaled. He replied with a shrug. And going back to the hotel for yours isn't exactly an option. Lily shook her head and smirked. Ironic. Entitled bitches like that are actually going to be useful for once, she said. I don't follow, he admitted, brow furrowing. A few months ago, some bridezilla came in with her entourage and started throwing a level five bitch fit about how there wasn't enough parking in the lot for her limo and all her friends' cars, Cam explained. She chewed our limp dick manager's ear off for twenty minutes, and instead of explaining to her there was a major conference going on at the hotel, he promised to handle it. Lily raised a finger. And by handle it, she declared, he meant make the staff car park off-site and carpool in one vehicle. And that off-site lot? Dante asked, a smile beginning to form on his face. It's off island, just across the water there, Lily replied, pointing. Bailey wrung her hands. Won't that take us too close to the bridge? She asked, worry evident in her tone. I don't really want to get shot at. Cam shook his head. Not only is our manager limp-dicked, he's also a cheapskate, he explained. The lot he rented for us is a mile down a gravel road running alongside a swamp. Those assholes will never know we're there. I like it, Dante replied, pointing at him. Let's get Philip and anybody else you want to bring along and get out of here before things start getting real bad. Lily lowered her gaze. None of our other friends made it, she said hoarsely. And unless you want to listen to that while we escape... 
she continued, motioning to the shrill woman. I would recommend leaving everyone behind, because they're all just like her. Not that they would listen to us anyway, Cam muttered. Okay, then, Dante agreed with a nod. Let's move. The four of them marched over to where Philip stood in front of the entitled customer. Now, you'd better be remembering all of this, she squawked. Because if you don't, and my room isn't refunded in full and my next day comped, then I'm going to have you fired. You understand me, little man? You don't know who you're dealing with. My father is... Lily tugged on Philip's arm. We're out, she said. The woman gaped at them, eyes wide with fury. Excuse me, did you just... Ma'am, Philip interrupted with his best customer service smile. If you would be so kind as to go fuck yourself, I would be forever in your debt. He raised both of his middle fingers and backed away. Bye, bitch, Lily said, giving a playful wave. The woman leapt up and grabbed her arm and Lily's eyes blazed. Oh, hell no, she snarled, and her inner redneck flared. She swung hard, catching the woman on the bridge of her nose, shattering her designer glasses and sending her tumbling into the sand. I'm going to have you all fired, she screeched through the blood pouring down her face. Every last one of you, and my daddy is going to sue you for everything you've got. The group clambered up into the boat, a smallish, single-engine vessel, ignoring the angry woman's wails. Cam was about to start it up, but Bailey glanced at Dante with a wide-eyed look. He understood what she was getting at and put a hand on Cam's shoulder. Hold up a second, he said. This isn't right. He stood up at the back of the boat and let out a loud whistle to get everyone's attention. Okay, everyone, listen up, he bellowed. Those things on the island running around, their bites are infectious. Those injured people are going to turn into those things soon. If you're smart, you'll get off this island and get someplace safe. After a brief moment of silence, somebody yelled out from the grass. Blow it out your ass, Frankenstein! A smattering of laughter rippled through the hotel guests, and Dante parked his ass, turning to Cam and motioning for him to go. Told you they wouldn't listen to us, he said apologetically. Dante shrugged. Well, my conscience is clear, he replied, which is all I really care about. He glanced at Bailey, who gave him a thankful smile for doing the right thing. Cam pulled the boat out onto the water, leaving the ignorant hotel guests on their own. Chapter 10 Cam guided the boat onto shore which was more rock than sand. Dante got out and helped pull it up a bit more as the others jumped down to land. When they were all ready, Lily took the lead. It should be just through the woods up here, she said, and headed through some dense brush. They came through the other side to a small lot. There were a dozen cars, but also a few zombies. Dante saw movement and grabbed Lily, pulling her back behind cover. She glared at him for a moment but then saw what he'd focused on and realized he'd just saved her ass. She gave him a pat on the arm to silently thank him. The group watched the zombies milling about. A few of them wore hotel outfits like the three employees hiding in the bush. Dante waved for the group to follow him back a bit so they could talk quietly. Friends of yours? he whispered. Lily shook her head. Not really. We just know them in passing, she said. Second shift coming in. Cam added. Which car is yours? Dante asked. Lily motioned vaguely. The sporty yellow one at the far end of the lot, sitting by itself so nobody scratches it up. God, are we all going to fit in that thing? Cam moaned. She smirked. You may have to sit in Philip's lap, she teased. But knowing him, he'll probably like it. Dante held up his hand. Does your car have a sunroof? He asked. Yeah? Why? she replied, brow furrowing in confusion. Because we don't have weapons, he explained, which means we're going to have to get creative. Bailey swallowed hard. Dante, she warned. It is amazing that you just met my sister this morning, and already you have that concerned tone down just like her, he muttered, chuckling. Don't worry, I'll be fine. So how do you want to do this? Lily asked. Dante held up his hands, motioning as he spoke. I'm going to come out running and get on top of a car, pulling all those things my way, he explained. As I'm doing that, I want the rest of you to stay in the bushes and get to your car. When you get pulled in, 
open up the sunroof and come pick me up. Just make sure you get close enough for me to make the jump. I can handle that, Lily replied with a firm nod. Here goes nothing, Dante said with a sigh, and got in position. He waited for the others to work their way around and took a few deep breaths. He knew this was far from his best idea, but they had to get out, get safe, and figure out how to get Grace back. He sprinted out from cover, running towards the first car he saw, a large family sedan that looked like it could fit half a dozen people comfortably. He jumped up on the truck and then effortlessly hopped up onto the roof. He smacked the hood a few times, letting out some whistles and yells, gaining the attention of every zombie in the parking lot. Yeah, come and get me, he bellowed. As he kept them occupied, Lily led the others through the dense brush to her car. She quickly unlocked the door and the others piled into the back seat so that Dante would have a place to land. It was tight, but they managed to fit. As soon as she started up the car, some of the zombies headed her way. Dante was concerned for a moment, but it subsided as he saw the car moving, his companions safely inside. Lily did a few cycles around the lot, trying to peel off a few of the ghouls from where Dante was, so she could get close enough for him to make a jump. Finally, on the third pass, she drove in, stopping about six feet from the other car. He stepped back as far as he could, took a step, and leapt, landing flat on his stomach on the roof of Lily's bright yellow car. The wind knocked out of him, he gasped for air, but managed to scramble his way into the passenger seat, head first. Once inside, Lily punched the gas, kicking up gravel into the faces of the zombies as she left them behind. She sped down the lot, finally hitting pavement before making the turn-off to the main highway. She looked both ways, seeing that the way out of town was clear. No mercenaries in sight. Dante finally managed to get himself situated in the passenger seat and regain his breath. You gonna make it there, cowboy? Lily nodded, grinning. He nodded as he fastened his seatbelt. Yeah, just a little winded, he huffed. Your roof packs quite a punch. She chuckled, petting the steering wheel. Yeah, my baby is tough, she cooed. They drove out of Bluffton, and there were signs of struggle everywhere. Abandoned, blood-stained cars, zombies running through the neighborhoods. As they slowed down to make their way through a wreck, Dante spotted a dozen zombies clustered around a house. In the window, a middle-aged man sat, cradling a shotgun. He waved to Dante, who waved back with a sad smile. As much as he wanted to help him, he knew he didn't have the means to. Instead, the group did the only thing they could do. Get to safety in Tillman and figure out what to do next. Chapter 11 The group drove through Tillman, South Carolina, which was exactly as described. Lily stopped at the stop sign, just to point out that she wasn't exaggerating. Told you, she declared. One stop sign. There's the gas station, slash restaurant, slash emergency clinic on the right. And that's about it. Dante raised an eyebrow. Emergency clinic? Don't let the name fool you, Lily drawled, rolling her eyes. It's just a toothless sixty-year-old man named Gator who gives you a shot of whiskey and a band-aid. If you're pretty, he'll even give your boo-boo a kiss. Dante touched his face. Finally, something going my way today. The group chuckled at his self-deprecating humor. They drove a mile up the road, making the turn into the lot of a run-down single-story brick home. There was a broken-down car on blocks on the far end of the lot, and various car parts scattered about. As she put the car in park, her cousin burst out of the house brandishing an AK-47. He was short, but jacked, with a black mullet and insane eyes. Lily honked her horn and stuck her head out of the window. Put that thing down, Ace, she drawled. Nobody is here to rob you. Lil, is that you? he asked, squinting at her as he let his guard down. What in the hell are you doing here? She got out of the car and put her hands on her hips. What the fuck do you think I'm doing here? She scoffed. The whole world has gone crazy and you're all the family I got nearby. Of course I'm coming here. And you felt like you needed to bring your friends, he replied dryly, rolling his eyes. Even better. She pointed a finger at him. Hey, when you and your dumbass friends got high and needed a place to crash, where did they do it at? She demanded. Ace wrinkled his nose, lowering his gaze petulantly. 
At your place, he admitted. And when you and your daddy threw that Molotov cocktail at the police car, Lily continued, whose basement did you hide in? He towed the dirt beneath his feet like a toddler. Yours, he muttered. Goddamn right, she replied, raising her chin. Now, show some hospitality. Ace strolled up to the group, staying focused on his cousin and then moving down the line of her companions, standing with her. To you, absolutely. What the hell am I supposed to do with a couple of hotel losers? He paused in front of Bailey and gave her a wink. Okay, you're cute. I can work with that, he continued, and then stopped in front of Dante, eyes widening. And holy fuck, he trailed off, staring intently at the bigger man's face. Ace! Lily snapped at her cousin's ignorance. I mean, Jesus Christ! The fuck happened to you? Ace drawled, eyes wide. Did you lose a fight with a belt sander? He chuckled to himself. Dante stared him down, speaking confidently. No, Ace. I just made the mistake of going down on your sister the other night, he drawled. Next time you see her, can you tell her to shave? Because as you can see, she really leaves a mark. I mean, I would say you'd see for yourself the next time you fuck her. But you strike me as the type to just pump and dump rather than showing one iota of interesting in getting your partner off, you inbred, sister-fucking, backwards mullet-wearing hillbilly. The silence was so thick. Nobody moved an inch. Lily stared at the two men, face pale. And then Ace burst out laughing, leaning over and slapping his thighs. Holy fucking shit, I fucking love this dude! He bellowed and pointed at his cousin. Lily, you gotta marry this guy. I need to be related to him. I was fucking gold, man. He threw an arm around Dante's shoulders, leading him back towards the house. Come on, let's get you a beer. It looks like you could use one. Dante looked back at Lily, bewildered, and she laughed, giving him a thumbs up. Rest of you come on too, Ace continued over his shoulder. There's something you need to see. The group hustled into the house, which was just as much of a crap heap as the outside. Y'all excuse the mess, Ace called. If you don't like it, feel free to sleep on the lawn. He plopped himself down on the couch and smacked the grimy cushions. What do you want to show us? Lily asked, taking a seat next to him. The rest of the group took their seats, Bailey perching half on the arm of the couch, looking more than a little uncomfortable at a large stain in the last empty spot. Just give me a second, Ace replied, pulling up the DVR. He scrolled through a bunch of his recordings, all clearly porn he'd ordered from pay-per-view. Lily groaned, shielding her eyes. Ace, really? She groaned. Don't judge, he said brightly. Internet's been down this week. He clicked through several programs, stopping on a wrestling show. Lily furrowed her brow, opening her mouth. Just shut your pie hole and watch. Ace said, flapping a hand at her. The intro to the program started, but about 45 seconds into it, the news came on. It was Channel 12 in Bluffton. The female anchor with the big hair was there, along with a snappy-dressed male co-anchor. This shit came on in the middle of the night, Ace gushed. Totally saw this in the morning and freaked out. Lily shushed him, leaning over and poking the volume button to turn it up. Our top story. Reports of rioting in Charleston and Savannah are coming in, the female anchor was saying. It appears to be in different parts of both cities, and we have a camera view on location in North Savannah. Let's go to them now. The feed changed, showing a young female reporter standing in the street. A fire raged behind her, and there were silhouettes of people running amok in the background. As you can see, the situation here is getting tense, the reporter began, motioning over her shoulder. Several people are rampaging for no apparent reason, and one local restaurant is currently ablaze. On our way here, we saw several other places like this, and... She stopped short, looking off screen, and somebody screamed right close to the camera, likely the cameraman himself. The view turned as the camera tipped over, hitting the ground and showing their feet. The reporter shrieked and ran towards the fire, several sets of feet chasing after her. The feed turned back to the newsroom. Well. Let's hope she's okay, the female anchor continued, as if nothing terrifying was happening. 
and we'll check back in with her later. Now let's go up to Charleston. Ace hit pause on the DVR. The room was silent. Everyone dealing with the idea that this issue was spreading around the region, not just near them. Man, Charleston and Savannah, Cam finally said, scrubbing his hands down his face. We're not going to be able to get away from this, are we? Philip took a deep breath. I mean, this stuff can't be everywhere, can it? He asked shrilly. Dante and Bailey shared a concerned look, both thinking about what the mercenary had said about A-type blood. Before he could speak up, however, Ace leaned forward, hitting fast forward on the newscast. Hate to burst your bubble there, bubba, he drawled, but we're all kinds of fucked here. He hit play on the newsroom again. And now we have some dramatic footage coming in from Austin, Texas, the female anchor continued, where it appears as though some sort of major bomb has gone off. The live feed showed huge plumes of smoke coming from downtown, filling the night sky with the glow of flames. The anchor's voice came through over top of the video. We don't have all the details, but when we do, we will bring them to you. And now... There was a commotion, and the feed came back to the newsroom, both anchors looking off screen with panic in their eyes. Oh God! Oh God! She screamed, throwing up her hands, and a zombie practically flew at her tackling her to the floor. The male anchor scrambled away, but his scream soon filled the space. I think we get the point, Ace, Lily muttered. He quickly turned the TV off. So, yeah, he said, leaning back and scratching his head. This stuff is everywhere. It's worse than that, Dante piped up. Ace gaped at him. How in the hell can it be worse than that? He demanded. We don't have proof. Dante admitted, raising his palms, just going off of what one of those mercenaries said on the bridge today. The virus targets anyone with the A blood type, so if you have A type blood, you turn into one of those things. There was a long pause, and then Philip asked hoarsely, How many people have that? Little less than half the population, Ace replied. When everyone turned to stare at him in shock, he shrugged sheepishly. What? They covered it in basic when I went through it. Bailey blinked at him. Your military? she asked. Kind of, he trailed off, tilting his hand back and forth in the air. Dislocated my hip and destroyed my knee six months out of basic during a training jump. He slapped his leg for effect. Military decided it was cheaper for them to cut their losses than keep pouring money into me. So I was discharged. But still... That information stuck. Lily put a hand to her forehead. Holy fuck, she breathed. Forty percent of the country are going to become those things? More when you factor in bites turning them, Dante added. Ace shook his head. This shit is going to get real ugly, real fast if that's the case, he said. Do me a favor, Dante said, inclining his head towards the TV. Turn it onto the live feed for Channel 12, will you? The redneck raised an eyebrow. Why? he asked. It's just dead air. Just humor me, please, Dante replied. Ace shrugged and changed the channel, which still showed an empty studio. See? Nothing, he said. Check the bottom of the screen, Dante prompted, and the group, minus Bailey, leaned in to read it. Well... I'll be damned, Ace breathed. I guess I should pay closer attention to things. Dante cocked his head. We could use some help going to go get her, he said. Whoa, now, the redneck drawled, raising his hands. You're cool and all, and I'm A-okay with you crashing on my pad as long as you need to, but there ain't no way in hell my happy ass is willingly going out there. Dante crossed his arms. She might have information on what is going on, he insisted. And about Theo Atkinson. Who the fuck is that? Ace asked. The leader of the mercenary group on the island, Dante explained, clenching a fist. His men kidnapped my sister Grace, and another one of our friends, Troy. The redneck shook his head slowly, spreading his arms. Man, I'm sorry for your loss and all, he said, eyes sincere. But I really don't see how going into Beaufort is going to help things. Dante glanced at Bailey, 
and she sat up straight, eyes widening into pleading orbs, pressing her palms together. But my mother and sisters are in Beaufort, she said, really close to the station. If you could help us out, I would be awful happy about it. The redneck withered a bit and then looked at his cousin. Lily put up her hands. Don't look at me, she drawled. You're the one trying to puss out in front of a pretty girl. Ace sighed. Okay, fine. We'll go into Beaufort, he said petulantly. But we ain't going today. It's going to be dark soon, and this doesn't seem like the kind of situation we want to be caught outside in without the sun. The group nodded approvingly, the mood brightening at the prospect of a plan. So, what you got in the fridge, cuz? Lily asked, slapping her knee and getting to her feet. We got a house full of hungry people, and I'm cooking. Ace pointed a finger at her. Just don't burn my kitchen down, he warned. That was one time, she scoffed, rolling her eyes. The duo led Cam and Philip into the kitchen, leaving Dante and Bailey on the couch alone. They stared at the TV, reading the scrolling message over and over. Finally, he looked over at the young woman, studying the concern on her face. Your family is fine, he assured her. They're probably more worried about you than you are for them. We'll get them tomorrow. She smiled, drawing her knees up to her chin. Thank you, she said quietly. You don't have a reason to do all this for me, but you still do. So thank you. He didn't say anything, just smiled and she returned it, leaning her head on his shoulder for a time. Yo, Scarface, heads up, Ace bellowed entering the living room and tossing a cold beer. Dante caught it and Bailey laughed, getting up and heading into the kitchen to join the friendly argument inside about what to eat for dinner. Ace plopped down onto the couch next to him as he cracked open the can. Scarface, huh? Dante asked and took a long gulp. Ace shrugged. Well, I was going to go with Leatherface, he drawled, but that would imply that you know how to use a chainsaw and I can't in good conscience be making assumptions like that. Dante chuckled and raised his can. Cheers. They clinked their cans and took long gulps. Really do appreciate the hospitality, Dante said sincerely. It's my pleasure, man, Ace replied with a grin. My cousin told me how you washed up on shore and saved her life. I got mad respect for you doing that. Whatever you need from me, I'm game. Dante nodded thoughtfully. Good to know, man. Good to know. Now, for the most important question of the day, the redneck declared, pointing a finger at him. How do you like your steak? Dante grinned. Just run it through a warm room and it should be good, he replied. Ace grinned, rubbing his palms together. Oh, this is gonna be fun, he said conspiratorially. Been a long time since I had a running partner. Yo, Lil! Your new man is fucking awesome! Dante sat quietly as the cousins playfully bickered. Everything else tuned out as he nursed his beer. Too many things ran through his head, but all of them revolved around one thing. Saving Grace. The End Up next, Grace and Troy fight for their survival against foes living and undead in Low Country, Part 2.